Mac and Smetty here. Dun, 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 dun. Welcome to another edition of Golick and Smetty. I am Mike Golick Sr. She is Jess Smetana, and we are in the final stages, obviously, of college football. We have Week 18 in the NFL. Uh, but, Jess, I don't think there's there's any doubt um, what we need to talk about at first and what we saw on Monday Night Football. I mean, one of the most horrific things I know, and we'll get into it, I ever saw on the field with uh, DeMar Hamlin and having to be resuscitated on the field and still – not really sure what's going on in the postponement of that game. That I'm, I'm sure you were watching it. I'm sure the millions that were watching it just had to be sitting there in stunned silence, uh, I would imagine. Yeah, Mike, it was really shocking to watch, and we obviously hope for the best for him. The current update uh, as of our recording of this is that he's still in the hospital. He's been sedated, and he's on a ventilator, and um, there was – it sounded like there were some promising signs that he's been able to take been you know starting to be be weaned off the ventilator so it's really scary and i i really like it was very very difficult to watch that on monday night and i know you know you played football and we've had tons of conversations about how violent and dangerous football is but i actually wanted to ask you first from your perspective as like a teammate, like what you're going through when you see something like that happen. But I also wanted to ask as someone now who broadcasts games, do you have any sort of plan for if something like that happens? Or is this such a freak accident that you don't think anyone really knows a a game plan when this happens? Jess, I I am used to, and, and football players are used to the external injuries, right? I've seen blown out knees, dislocated elbows, broken fingers, you know, everything under the sun whether it's happened to me or it's happened to somebody else on the field or in practice, that's what we're all used to. That's what we have all signed up for, and we know it. We know it's not you might get hurt playing football. When you reach the level of the NFL, you've played a lot of football. It's pretty much a guarantee you're going to have hurt yourself at some point along the way. It's just a matter of how bad. But again, we immediately see high ankle sprain, four to six, torn ACL, 10 to 12 months, maybe sooner. You know, we, we like already have in our mind the number of times, your uh, amount of time you're going to be out. But the one thing that you never worry about is someone dying. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's not in our equation. Our equation is the outside physical joint stuff. Whenever it goes to the inside, we are now at a loss. So, for your, your asking about the broadcasting side, I would have no plan, nothing. I would just be, you know, it's one of those when I see something happen on the field and I know how a guy walks, if he's holding the shoulder or how he's limping, I can, I can assess and say, I believe it's this. You know, I'm not a doctor, but I believe it's this because I've seen it a number of times. Something like that, I mean, you just, like Troy and Joe did, you kind of just sit there in kind of a stunned silence, and and now you're waiting for information. There's no way you want to speculate anything, anything on that at all. Um, and as far as even a teammate, forgetting even a teammate, this is now a brotherhood thing of, of all teams, of all players, any player who was watching that night. I've said this a thousand times, Jess, in the locker room when somebody has a, a bad injury. You're like, man, you feel bad for him. You know what's involved with him. And then you say, well, that's not going to happen to me. We all think that at a young age, we feel invincible. Then you're at a young age and you're playing at the highest level of football. You think nothing can happen to me. And then, you know, one play later, something happens. But again, something that we know how to assess from a, an injury standpoint. This, I mean, I was somewhat in shock sitting there watching that. I can't even fathom what those players who were watching what was going on, watching a young man playing a game of football being resuscitated on the field just to breathe again, you know, let alone being carted off because of an injury. So I, I, it, this blows my mind. And I've heard other players talk about this, and it is true. You, you get desensitized to injury, right? We'll be in training camp. This has happened more than a few times. Someone blows out a knee during nine-on-seven, and it's move the drill. You know, you move the drill 15 yards, the doctors take care of that guy, and you're two minutes later, you're back into practice. 
you know, and you're you're just you're just going. That's that's the nature of the game. But this this is not the nature of the game. This is not you just keep going. Uh, and I'm glad they all went the way. And I know there's been a lot of did the NFL really say five minutes, you know, right, get ready yeah. to play again. They say they didn't. I mean, I don't even want to get into that stuff. The right decision was made. Um, and, and now now it's going to be DeMar is first and foremost in everybody's mind. But now it, also at some point, the sport has to come back into it. OK, that game's not going to be replayed, certainly this week. As the taping of this, we don't know what's going to happen with games, but there's a whole other slate of games. You know, we're, we're taping this on a Wednesday. Wednesday, Jess, is the install day. That's when you mm-hmm. get ready for the – put the game plan in for your next game. Well, Buffalo and Cincinnati have a game coming up in Week 18. So not only did they not finish that game, they still don't know. Now, they'll know before any of us where DeMar is. And that's what you're waiting to hear. You're waiting to hear he's progressing and things are going to be okay. But we have no idea how long that'll take. So now these guys are supposed to get ready for the next game in week 18 until the league decides what's going to happen. So this is, there's no manual. There's no, this is no man's land, quite honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what is so crazy and, and shocking and what was, I think a lot of people were trying to process on Monday night and have been trying to process since we saw it happen was that it there are like so many known risks when you're playing football like you said the the knees the ankles even the concussions which there's still so much debate about that happening and and before the injury on monday night there was the the big topic of conversation with injury was Tua now having another right. concussion. And I thought that that would be what we were going to talk about um, this week on our show. And then of course this happens and it's not something that we've seen before. And at least, at least have, have not seen in, in decades in the NFL, an injury this severe happening on the field. So um, I guess I wonder, do you think that uh, from, from everything that I've read and heard, it sounds like the, the plan that the NFL had in place to, provide the emergency medical attention went off the way it was supposed to. And it may have ended up ultimately, you know, saving his life. Um, He was able to go to the hospital immediately in an ambulance. And those are all things that, you know, seconds are of the utmost importance. But aside from, from like the emergency response, do you think there's going to be any, any change in the way the game is played? Or is this something that we just don't see very often? and, And therefore we, in a year we'll have put it, out of our minds somehow. So th- that's, that's a great question. And one people ask when something this devastating happens is how can we avoid it from happening next time? So with the, the, the concussion situation and the lawsuit and all that going on, the league took steps to change some rules to try and take away head injuries all the way down from, from pros to college to high school to Little League. You know, we said, okay, this, this could be a potential problem and a long-range problem. We certainly know that, that it is. So what can we do to help that? This is one of those, first off, at least, again, at the taping of this, we don't know, and I'm going to keep saying that because something may change by the time you people listen to this, is we don't know the exact cause. We're hearing speculation of just being hit in the chest at the right time with the electrical Things in the heart, you hit at the exact time. Like when a, when a baseball player gets hit in the chest with a baseball or a lacrosse player with a lacrosse ball, you know, that, that something like this has happened. And we don't know if, it's, if that is it. We don't know if there was an underlying issue. That, that's something we don't know. I mean, because, Jess, you look at that. You saw, we all saw the, we know hits that we see and go, ooh, that could cause something. This looked like a mundane routine hit, right? He took a, a little yeah. hit to the chest. He went down, he got up, and then he went down again. I mean, so, I, I, you know, you're waiting to, to see it being some sort of devastating hit to say, oh, man, something's going to be bad there. Yeah. And it wasn't. So my only initial thought right now is I don't know what you do. I don't know what you do about that. I mean, a, yeah. again, until we get the diagnosis of exactly what it was. But if, in fact, it was just that right perfect timing of, a horrible timing of being hit in the chest <clears throat> at the wrong time and this happening. Listen, getting hit in the chest is not going to stop in the NFL. But again, yeah, this is right. nothing we've really seen. I know we've had players, you know, go back to what, 71, the, the Detroit line, I think it was Hughes who, who passed away. I mean, there have been devastating things that have gone on, paralyzed players. We know, you know, like a Daryl Stingley or Utley, you know, that, that, that have happened yeah. on the field. And we've seen that because we see it now. 
when players are carted off, a lot of time we say that's for precautionary reasons on a backboard, but there have been a few times in the NFL where that person ended up being paralyzed. So there can be those devastating hits. But on this one, I, I don't know, Jess. I don't know if there's you can look at it and say, well, yeah, well, this is going to have to change in the game now. I just think it was just – Wrong place, wrong time, wrong time uh, spot to get hit, it, it seems, unless we find out something different. And and everyone just now circles around, and that's the thought. I mean, the people that, you know, with with his uh, toy drive of where that's gone, you know, with the GoFundMe, how, I love people just stepping up, you know, and doing such great things, players in the league that are stepping up uh, as well. It's great to see, but, man, all you do is think about that, that young man. And, and, and I guess that's it, it is – and I tweeted this after it happened is people think that we're, you know, at times robots where you just go play, you know, this is what we do because at times, like we said, an injury happens, a devastating one, someone blows out their knee. That's a year of, of they're away. They get carted off the field and you just keep playing. You're just desensitized. You, you go right back to it. But at the end of it all with something horrific happening, you know, we're not robots that we do have emotions and feelings and you sit there and see that you're next to that. You know, and see all what went on. And and we can't give enough kudos to the response team out there and what they did uh, for DeMar and and how quickly they got there. I didn't even realize, Jess, and and, in all honesty, players don't really want to know because you don't think about getting hurt. But I had seen on Twitter the other day all the medical personnel that are at NFL games, you know, from from, uh, trauma specialists to head specialists to dentists to all the different personnel that are there. I didn't even realize all of that. And, and, and again, I'll say, as a player, I didn't want to see a list of all that because that just brings, I hope I don't need them into my mind, and you never mm-hmm. want to think about that. So they, the, the preparedness and the response, I mean, let, let's say it, it, it literally saved his life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think when I was watching it, the closest that thing that I could think of in my memory was how I felt when I watched Ryan Shazier get injured right. against Cincinnati a few years ago. And that was um, a little bit more, like, personal, I think, because I was a fan of his being a Steelers fan and also, like, following his career at Ohio State. Like, it felt really, really scary. And it, it honestly did take me a while to kind of, like, get really into a game because when you you get shocked like that like as a fan it's very difficult to then be like why do we even watch this thing in the first place and I'm wondering like your entire life has been football right Mike and and your kids lives and your career and everything like how do you kind of grapple with that when you see something like this happens like where do you find um the peace in being being a football fan or being a sports fan when something crazy like this happens well quite honestly I thought more about it when my kids played because then I have no control, you know. I mean, Jake, you know, had two back surgeries at Notre Dame, snapped his arm during a practice, had to get a plate in there. Uh, that, that's, you know, small potatoes compared to what we saw. But I'm just telling you, I was more concerned when I'm sitting in the stands because I can't control it. Those guys as players don't think about it, you know, Mike and Jake or any player or me. When you're playing – you're playing and you've played for so long, you just you just naturally play. It never enters your mind that you're going to get hurt. You just can't think about that and you just become programmed to not think about that. As I said, you're almost programmed to when you see someone get hurt, you say, that's a shame, but it's not going to happen to me. When we literally all know in the back of our minds that on any given play, something horrible could happen, but you never, never think it could be this horrible. What happens on a field... <clears throat> Not so much the knee, the elbow, that kind of thing, is when you get the the head injury or the neck injury. All you're thinking about when I was on the field or when I was calling a game or watching a game is move. Just show me some movement. That's what I want to see. I I hit Jeff Hostetler in a game one time with the Giants when I was at the Eagles, and he had to be carted off the field. But he was moving. So there's the relief of, okay, well, he's moving everything, so... I feel better about that because you never want never want to see anybody get hurt. But that's always a thought process. And here, I mean, he's not moving. And I don't know what everybody thought at first because if you're on the field, you didn't really see the player know what it would be. All you know is your yeah, guy is down true. and nobody mm-hmm. – and he is not moving. So that's the biggest fear as you're looking at that is like, does he have a head injury, a neck injury? What is it? And then when they come out and they're doing CPR, you're going, holy shit. You know, what What the hell is going on? 
And then that's what you're still waiting for. Now, now it goes from move to breathe. You know, I mean, it, it's, I, I, again, I, I, I felt it as a player just watching, but it by no means, you know, what those guys felt on the field who were right there, whether you were with the Bills or with the Bengals, it didn't matter. You were there witnessing that something, because every player on that field has witnessed an injury, either uh, an injury that they got or saw somebody else get hurt. So they've all dealt with that. But that was something that there, there ain't no book for. There ain't no book for yeah. how to deal with it. Well, you, you already mentioned um, DeMar Hamlin's charity drive getting millions of dollars yeah. in donations, which has been cool to see. I actually thought, I mean, there's everyone wants to point fingers and like get mad at other people when yeah. something really unexpected like this happens. But I thought ESPN actually handled it pretty well. Um, I, I did turn off my TV after, you know, 40 minutes and just was like, I, I don't even know what to do with myself right now after what I just saw. But um, I'm just very, very hopeful that he'll be okay and his family gets the love and support that they need from certainly the league and his teammates and fans. Um, but it was – hopefully something we won't see happen again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly uh, just a, a incredibly sad situation. So um, I don't, don't know what else there is to say well, about it. You, you, I, for me, it's like you hope they find out the cause, right? And okay, what caused this? And for him, what's his future look like? You know, forgetting even football, is there is there damage, you know, to the brain, to the lungs? That That's what we're waiting to hear. What – is there, you know, the normal life that he's going to lead? And that's, that's what everybody wants. Are you going to be okay? And then uh, hopefully lead a normal life. And we don't know where it's going to go. We, we don't. So you're right. All you can do is keep thinking about him. And, and, and the, the where, again, people will get angry with because the games are going to go on next week, right? I mean, at least at yeah. this point, because I heard one of the options was just cancel all the games next week, and then everybody has 17 games, and you deal with the playoffs and everything going forward based on 17 games. Now, I'll say again, I'll repeat again, at the taping of this, there's been no decision made, and we have no idea what the decision is going to be made. And I understand that football is secondary, but football is going to come back into play as far as what is going to happen in week 18 and the playoffs and with those two teams that didn't play the game. Um, and hopefully before all that happens, we hear more great news about DeMar, but, but that is also the inevitability is the, 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 the season. I doubt it unless you think differently, isn't going to stop. You know, it's, it's going, it's going to keep going. It's just a matter of what route they want to go, and some people will rip it and some people won't, you know, but you, you can't worry about that. You just have to try and figure out, first and foremost, everything is being done for DeMar, it seems to be, and which is great, and then what's the next step on the other side of this coin, and that's and that's the rest of the season. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I don't think... I don't think football stops for no. <laughs> for anyone or anything, um, whether or not you think that's good or, right, or not. Right. But, um, yeah, I think we'll take a break here and we will awkwardly segue yeah. into other football things after this. Mike, we haven't talked to each other since before Christmas. So, first, I want to hear about anything fun you did over the holidays. But I already know one of the things that you did over the holidays that looked like it was fun, which was make fun of Darius Rucker in a, a suite at the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville. So maybe maybe you can start by talking about that. Yeah, that was um, – so bowl season, obviously, between Christmas and New Year's, so many games, and we'll get into, obviously, the title game <clears throat> that is going to be played with TCU and Georgia. Uh, but, yeah, the Gator Bowl down in Jacksonville with South Carolina and Notre Dame and – once that game was set, Darius had, had texted us and said, hey, uh, come, whoever wants to come down, come on down. You know, we'll, we'll hang out and, and have some fun. And Darius is part of a uh, ownership group of an agency. Um, and they have Trevor Lawrence as one of their clients. So the game was down in Jacksonville, that, that stadium. So obviously Darius knows a lot of people anyway, but he knows certainly a lot of people there. So we were fortunate enough to uh, – because of Darius to get a suite there. And I went down and my son, Mike, my son, Jake, and my uh, son-in-law, Ben, it was kind of a guy's thing. <clears throat> we flew down to Jacksonville and there were a number of people in the suite. We were basically the only Notre Dame guys. 
and Darius kept trying to bring Ben over because Ben he's like, Ben, you didn't go to Notre Dame, you went to Harvard. So <laughs> when South Carolina starts winning this game, you can come over to our side. And it was actually, you know, a really good game. I mean, it yeah. turned out to be a, a really, really good game. Both sides, just like every team in, in the Bulls, uh, were missing players uh, who opted out or were injured or for whatever reason they weren't going to play. Uh, but we were, uh, yeah, we were up in the suite and it was back and forth, you know, a bit. And we were enjoying ourselves, maybe had a few shots here and there that, that might have snuck in. And yeah, things, <laughs> things got going pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, and then when Notre Dame was what up seven and they were looking like they were going to score and go up yeah. 14 and that would have been it. South Carolina, to their credit, they got a hundred yard interception return for a touchdown uh. to tie it up at 38. And we're like, Oh my God. I mean, it was it was crazy, and then Notre Dame goes down and scores it and wins it. But that was a, it was a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie; it, we we enjoyed ourselves a lot. This was uh, you know a little bit before the new year. Uh, it's it's always fun to watch a game in a suite. Not going to lie, uh, because there's yeah, food and drink. It is nice. So there's there's lots no, of drink. Yeah, there's nothing. There's lots of drink. Let me just say, as there. I could tell from Gojo's text messages after the game, Mike, I have to say, and maybe like this is kind of a difficult question because it's based on a hypothetical, but hypothetically, if Notre Dame loses the Gator Bowl, and so you have that pick six for 100 yards yeah. from South Carolina, you have the end of the Marshall game and the end of the Stanford game, which moment would have been the low point in the season? Luckily, we don't have to choose between those three. But for me, watching that 100-yard pick six, I nearly lost it. Like, I nearly turned into the Joker watching the end of that game. <laughs> I, you know, if you ask me those three, I would probably lean toward Marshall or Stanford because, you know, those, those both those losses, you know, if we're a two-loss team, you know, if we just lost to Ohio State in the first game and USC in the last game, we're probably in an even bigger bowl, right? True. Um, but I, I, at the point, Stanford beat us. It was earlier in the season, but they had only beaten Liberty at that point. Uh, I think no, or was it Colgate? It was one of the two. They they had beaten Colgate. some Colgate, it was Colgate, Colgate, yeah. and, and that was and and we lost to them. So that yeah. I think that one still stings the most, and because South Carolina had been playing well, I mean they they had yeah. been really playing well at the end of the year. Shane Beamer, I love the guy. You know Frank Beamer's son, um, a young coach, just like Notre Dame with Marcus, young coach, both have their teams going in the in the right direction right now. So. It would not have bugged me as as much. The the worst part of it would have been sitting next to Darius with his Gamecock <laughs> shirt on, you know, if if they had won that game. Uh, but I I still think the Stanford loss would have would have gotten me the most in that one. But uh, it was a, it was it was a great win uh, that then led into. I flew right from there to um, God. I don't even remember what game I did last week. Uh, but I flew. I flew to. Isn't that amazing? Did you do the Steelers? Did you do the Steelers Ravens game? That's right. Okay. Pittsburgh. That's I, what I flew, flew to Baltimore from Jacksonville and got there in time to watch both the the college playoff games. Which man, were awesome. And and, and yeah. I'll say it just because I always like to pat myself on the back. I got both picks right. I picked TCU. And I, really? and I picked Georgia. Yes. Yes, I did. Wow. I not a lot of people pick TCU. I will tell you which upset I got right this weekend. In one of my confidence pools, I had 22 points on Tulane over USC. What a game! And that game was just insane. The last four minutes were awesome. Fantastic um, game. That. How about Tulane? What did they go from two and ten to twelve and two or whatever it was? It was is, ridiculous. I think it's the, uh, the first time a team uh, team has ever gone from a two win team to a twelve win team in back to back seasons. Like you have to just be in awe of, yes. of the turnaround they've had this year under Willie Fritz. But um, what a what a weekend of college football games. The playoff, like you said, rarely do we get two close games like we did with the Fiesta Bowl and the Peach Bowl. And it was almost like after the Fiesta Bowl ended and it ended up being, you know, a three-point game, even though at times TCU was up by right. multiple, I, th I think three possessions at one point. Um, but the third quarter, what, there were 44 points scored. It was incredible. And it was just an absolutely crazy, crazy quarter. And then after that, you thought, like, well, surely the Peach Bowl is going to be a blowout then because we never get two good semifinal games back-to-back. -back. And then it wasn't. It, that ended up coming down to a 50-yard shanked field goal as time expired, as, you know, the clock struck midnight on the East Coast, which was, like, super crazy, super cool moment. Um TCU is now going to be, I think, a 12 and a half point yeah. 
underdog going into the national championship game next week, which I'm sure we will talk about on next week's show. But I think it's pretty cool that they made it to the to the championship. I mean, that's another team that had a really significant turnaround season uh, season over season. Last year, they only won, I think, five games this year, made it to the playoff. You know, they lost the, the conference championship, but they still made it in. They beat Michigan. Michigan, um, I mean, cr- credit to Michigan for, like, actually – Staying in the game despite yeah. the huge, uh, you know, lead that TCU took, but they also like much like Notre Dame's bowl game, throwing two pick sixes in yeah. the game yep. is really difficult to overcome. Yeah, no, that really is. And you look at both teams; they ran the ball. Michigan ran it forty times. TCU ran it forty-one times, and they still passed it a lot. McCarthy threw it thirty-four times, and uh, Duggan threw it twenty-nine. So they all ran a lot of plays in this. And the, the one thing we didn't get. Uh, in the two playoff games, is defense. <laughs> I mean... I mean, look, yes and no. Like, TCU did... They did prevent well, Michigan from scoring in the red zone right. enough times. I think Michigan ended up with a 40% goal-to-goal... Uh, go-to-goal percentage and, like, 57% red zone efficiency at the end of the game. Like, there, one of those things was that touchdown that was called back and it was the Michigan player was down on the one and right. then they fumbled it right but you know there were a couple key turnovers and I would say TCU's defense did enough that they were able to turn the game around so that TCU never got behind Michigan if but, that had happened early on I don't know if they would have been able to overcome that you know and you're right because two pick sixes that, that's obviously you know your defense and so for TCU's defense that's a great job and for the big 12 I think it's great because we're always waiting for them to find a way to blow it you know, to kind of not knock each other out of consideration or sometimes we don't feel the committee gives them enough. Uh, I'm sure the Big 12 doesn't feel the committee gives them enough respect, uh, though the Pac-12 even less, quite honestly. Um, but TCU obviously deserved to be there. Uh, and, and it, w- wow, what a game. Now you wonder if, if Jim Harbaugh is going to end up back in the NFL. Here we go with that dance again, right? I know, second year, second year in a row, or th- maybe even the third year in a and row. And I get it. I think he'll end up back in the, in the NFL. It's just a matter of if he feels there's a right job. You know, there's obviously Carolina and Denver people mention uh, right out of the gate. So, so we'll see. And then the Georgia-Ohio State game. I mean, Georgia won the title last year. I thought they were the best team. but And, and I think they're the best team this year, but they're not as good as last year. They're giving mm-hmm. up points on defense. Last year their defense was ridiculous. This year, they're definitely giving up some points and being down two touchdowns, two scores a couple of times in this game. And then you feel bad when it's all on one guy, the kicker. But that that's the life of a kicker. And just just absolute shank, unfortunately, on that. But when the score is that high, you can't just look at one play. You, you, there, there's plenty of reasons or opportunities that you should be able to have um, when the score is that high. You know, if it was like a 10-7 to 7 game, then you maybe think a little differently, but... Uh, uh, being that well, close. Yeah, it's also like if it's a 35-yard field goal right, then right. And, and he totally shanks it, then you're like, oh, my. Pressure oh, got no. to him you know, and all that's, that. Yeah. That's really tough. But 50 yards, I mean, I know we see kickers do insane things now. Like, it seems like every year there's a, a new record for longest field goal. But 50 yards is so difficult, especially, you know, in the pressure of the moment in that game. So I certainly do not blame him for it. There's other, other little – things you can blame for them being in that situation in the first place. It was really, I mean, I thought CJ Stroud had a really good game. I thought that Mm -hmm. um, Georgia actually didn't play very well until towards the end of the game, but it didn't matter because as soon as they turned it on, like Stetson Bennett executed one incredible 70, I think it was a 76 yard pass. That was all they needed. And it was really, really cool to watch the back and forth there. But um what a crazy, crazy playoff weekend. And I don't know if we'll ever get one like that again. Of course, we don't. We, we might have extra games next year. Right, so right. And, and, and we've seen, <laughs> unfortunately, Notre Dame's been part of them, but we've seen other teams in the semis get destroyed, you know, get beat bad. So at least yeah. this year we, we had, you're right, two close games. So I, that, that, was, that was huge. So by the time we tape next week, the game's going to be over. So who, who do you like in this game? I like Georgia, but I don't want to. I don't want to even say that because I think there have been probably four or five times this season that where I've been like TCU is going to lose. Like they they're one of like they're due. It's time they're not going to go undefeated. Whatever. Like 
they were going to lose this one. Like, I at the end of the Baylor-TCU game this year, I was like, this is the one. They're, they're, they're going to lose this game. And then, of course, they go out and kick that game-winning yep. field goal as time's expiring. And I'm like, all right, maybe not. Maybe they're the team of destiny. I don't want to bet against the Hypno-Toads. Yeah. They seem <laughs> like they've got so many good vibes going for them. Obviously, the spread is huge. And like you said, Georgia has so many NFL guys on their team. But I think, like... I think it's a really interesting, uh, you know, interesting commentary on college football in that TCU fired their coach last year, right. brought in a new coach who had been a head coach previously, who got fired from the Cal job and then, you know, went to SMU, did pretty good there, got the TCU job. They brought in a bunch of guys from the portal, but right. kept some of their, you know, existing guys. And then early in the season, you know, they have a quarterback controversy and they still threw all of that. Be, like they had an identity as a team, they had a cohesion as a team. They played well. They were coached extremely well. Yeah, and it paid off. And like I think, I think there's so many arguments about the right way to do college football now, where it's like, do you bring the five star guy from Oklahoma to USC, and is that the is that the way to do it now? You get the offensive coordinator to bring the five star guy to wherever you are. Like how do you? How do you manipulate the portal? How do you get the right people and the right personnel in place? Or do you not get anyone from the portal? Because there's certainly, you know, look at Georgia. Like, there's teams that don't really do the portal at all. Because they get all the, um, all the big-time And this was a little athletes, bit yeah. of how to do everything the right the right way, I guess. Like, they did what was right for their team, their their scheme, the system they needed. Um, and and it has paid off dividends. So there's not – I don't think my, – my takeaway from it is there's not – one correct way to manage a roster or, you know, to, to coach a football team. I think the TCU team had a lot of good things going for it, and it, it really paid off. You're a thousand percent correct. I mean, you, you think about it. Say you have a young team. You're not going to bring in a fifth-year star quarterback, you know, for that one year for a young team. You know, then you're there you're going to probably try and bring in people from the portal who have a couple of years of eligibility left to help grow with that young team. If you have an older team – you know, maybe you want to bring in that that quarterback who's in his fifth year, only has one year left. So, or maybe you lost a lot of players in the portal, so you need to bring some in. So, I, you're a, a thousand percent correct. And instead of in the initial part of this with NIL and the portal, so many people complained, especially coaches, saying, "Oh, our job is is that much harder." Tough. You know what? It's the way yeah, it right. is. <laughs> so you can either bitch about it and and complain about it, or you can embrace it and say, "Okay." We're allowed to do this now. This is what we have to do uh, to try and become a better team. And you're right. He did a great job at TCU. So you think Georgia will win, but how about you think they'll cover? So we'll go with the 12 and a half. Yeah, I think so. We'll, we'll go with that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going, I think we'll go, we'll I'm go going Georgia that. wins, but I'm saying they don't cover. I think TCU can put points on the board. You know, Michigan has an excellent defense. Now, I know TCU got 14 points on, the, on their defense, you know, with the pick sixes. But um, I, I do like what TCU did, so I'm going to say they, they didn't, they're not going to, that Georgia's not going to cover, but they're going to win. And maybe a lot of that is out of hope. You know, we got two good semifinals. Let's hope we get a finals that's good as well yeah. uh, to, to close out the season. And then do you believe it? College football is going to be over. Ugh. No, I don't want that to happen. I mean, isn't it? A, it's a horrible thought. I mean, we, we, what are we, we going to talk about on this All show? we do after the Super Bowl is complain until we get football, actual football again, you know, not draft and free agency. And then it starts and then it's over. All of a sudden, we're talking about the national championship game and the playoffs starting in the NFL. And we're like, my God, where did it all go? It does go by really quickly. And I think it has been such an up and down season for us as Notre Dame fans. I am very, very relieved to go into the college football off season with a victory Mike because that was not guaranteed if you were watching no. the first half of that no. Gator Bowl game I'm really glad you got to uh rub Darius's face in it a little yep. bit oh yeah um and that was your repayment for him allowing you to be in his very nice uh owner That's exactly suite. right so really really solid work there good friendship I'm glad everyone uh, enjoyed the boys trip to Jacksonville. <laughs> it's always good when you're good, good enough friends where you can talk shit. And, uh, and there was a whole, oh, yeah. whole lot of that going on. So let, let me, let me end this with, with this. We, we, uh, over the holidays, what's the best thing you made? Cause I saw your Instagram and my God, you were, you were, if that was all stuff you were making, I mean, you, you were firing it all up. What was the best? 
That's a really tricky question. I made a lot of cookies. I made a lot of gingerbread biscotti. And I made a cranberry curd tart, which I know sounds kind of weird. Yeah. It sounds like... It does. You know, you know, I know, I know cranberry sauce is hit or miss for people, too. Yeah, yeah. But it was so good. Mike, if we... If we get to see each other at some point this winter, I will make it for you. And I know you will like it. I will make sure of that. Because you're right. Saying it doesn't sound that appealing. Curd is a, it's a gross, it's a gross sounding it word. And, it all, is. and like cranberries kind of are like sour. And, yeah. Yeah. But well, no, it's delicious. It's very good. All right. Well, I look forward to someday eating all that because as I said, my birthday was December 12th and. I never I got anything. I, in that's the mail. true. I I really was I really was gonna bake you some cookies, and then I I got sick, and then I ran out of time, and then my flight got canceled. It was a whole wow. Thing, there's a right? lot of but, excuses going on right but now. But you know Holy what? You smokes. know what? In less than twelve months, you'll be turning sixty-one, and maybe you'll get some cookies then. So we're gonna end this right now before I say something <laughs> I regret. Goodbye. <laughs>